Hello and welcome to Views on News. I am Jawad Hami. After two days of deliberations, consultations and proposals and recommendations, the National Security, uh, Security Committee of Pakistan uh, expressed the firm resolve to crush all the terrorist groups operating against Pakistan. The forum also sent an unequivocal message to the authorities in Afghanistan that they should deny the safe haven to the terrorist groups operating against Pakistan from the Afghan soil and end their patronage. Let me read out the statement uh, after this particular huddle that Pakistan's security is uncompromisable and the full writ of the state will be maintained on every inch of Pakistan's territory." Unquote. Now we have seen a continuous expression of support and help by the United States of America towards Pakistan uh, in dealing with the, the TTP threat and also in the counter-terrorism domain. And now the State Department spokesperson, Mr. Ned Price, has said, let me quote, Pakistani people have suffered tremendously from terrorist attacks and Pakistan has a right to defend itself from terrorism. Unquote. Earlier, during an interaction with the media, Foreign Minister Mr. Bilawal Bhutto Zardari had said that the coalition government would quit the policy of appeasement of terrorists and there will be no longer any dialogue with the banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan and the message would be conveyed to the Afghan Taliban. On the other hand, we have seen contradictory statements coming from the Afghan authorities. Earlier, they had been expressing the resolve and promising the Pakistani authorities that the Afghan soil won't be allowed to be used against Pakistan. Then there was an utter denial by the spokesperson of the de facto Afghan authorities, Zabihullah Mujahid, saying that the impression that the TTP has safe havens in Afghanistan was incorrect. And now, uh, in a recent statement, uh, Zabihullah Mujahid had criticized uh, the statements which were coming by the Pakistani officials. Earlier, Interior Minister Rana Sanaula had hinted of taking a direct action in Afghanistan against the TTP militants if the Afghan authorities don't take any action against them. The Defense Minister after the NSC huddle also had said that the Afghan soil was being used against Pakistan. We'll be talking about, after this expression of the firm resolve at the NSC, what sort of options Pakistani authorities would be going with in order to deal with this particular uh, TTP threat and what do statements by the Afghan authorities depict? Are they contradictory and what uh, sort of engagement amid these statements coming from the Afghan authorities, Pakistan needs to and do. Now, how significant is the continuous expression of support and help by the United States of America towards Pakistan? And what could be the practical manifestation of that? We'll be looking into all these questions and to talk more about this, we are honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Nasir Ali Khan, his former ambassador. Mr. Nasir Ali Khan, thank you very much for your time, for being on Views and News. We really appreciate your time. And uh, on Skype, we are being joined by Lieutenant General Retired Muinuddin Heather, his former Federal Interior Minister and former Governor Sindh. General Muinuddin Heather, thank you very much for your time, for being on Views on News. We really appreciate that. Let me begin the discussion with you, Mr. Khan. What uh, do you think these statements coming from the Afghan authorities, first they expressed resolve to support Pakistan and not allow the Afghan soil to be used against Pakistan. Then there comes an utter denial from their spokesperson that the TTP is not there on the Afghan soil. And now they say that they are committed to uphold peace and stability in the region. What do these statements depict? Uh, personally, I think that the Afghan Taliban at, at no point was sincere in, in actually uh, uh, making uh, or forcing or compelling the TTP uh, not to have attacks uh, in, in Pakistan. Uh, they have had a very long association and we should have realized their intentions when uh, one of the first acts when they came into power uh, was to release all the TTP prisoners from Afghan jails. Uh, if you go back uh, for the last 20 years or more, there has been a very close cooperation between the two outfits. Uh, I have to say that there are uh, different factions in both TTP and TTA. So, so at times uh, there have been divergent views, etc. But what the Afghan Taliban had promised us 
the, uh, that they would be helping in uh, negotiations. Now, apart from that, they have not put any significant pressure on the TTP uh, to not take the path of violence. So now uh, we have reached a point where I think we have to assert ourselves and, and to make sure that everybody gets the message that this sort of behavior, which you know, in the last year, year and a half, is, is totally unacceptable to us. So, yes. Please go ahead. So what I'm trying to say is the, the TTP uh, at any negotiation has only used that space uh, to either uh, be able to move their families or move themselves uh, or to buy time for one reason or another. Uh, they've used these ceasefires and they are not, uh, you know, they don't seem to be sincere in, in these efforts. Before. Even when... Uh, they promised to cross the border into Pakistan uh, without their arms. Uh, they are often found to then buy the arms very easily when, once they are in Pakistan. So we have to put our foot down and we have to tackle this issue. Uh, and, and further to this, I think we can have the discussion on how right. I feel the uh, best possible approach your, would be. Your point is well taken that Pakistan needs to be assertive when it comes to engaging with the Afghan Taliban in particular. Uh, General Heather, uh, now we uh, see assertive statements coming from the Pakistani authorities and there has been a hint by the Interior Minister Rana Sanaula that if no action by the Afghan authorities taken against the TTP uh, militants on the Afghan soil, Pakistan might consider uh, taking a direct action in Afghanistan. Now this particular statement was criticized by the Afghan Authority spokesperson Zabiullah Mujahid that uh, it is baseless and provocative. So they take offense from these statements coming from the authorities of uh, a neighboring state that had helped them in facilitating the Afghan peace and recon uh, reconciliation process. But we don't see them getting offended by the statements or the kinds of acts of aggression that happen from uh, banned Tariqa Taliban Pakistan. Why is that so? Yes, the promise that they'll help us in the negotiations to have lasting peace in the region, especially of Pak Afghan border on both sides. Uh, but that did not happen. They did not deliver. They said we will facilitate. But I don't think there was much facilitation. And once uh, many of these people were released from the jail, they came <clears throat> and occupied many places, especially in Sabat, high hills, and they had weapons and they started asking for money uh, from, from, from there. And they started their business as it was happening 25 years ago when we took very strong action to take Sawad back and establish the writ of the government. So they started where they had left. They started the business from there. And Afghans, <clears throat> they may say so, that we don't have anything to do with Tariq, uh, Taliban, Pakistan, and that we negotiate and we deal with them. But the fact is that they have lived there. They have fought, you know, aside the Afghans against Americans, against Russians, against others. So they have, you know, established a sort of brotherhood. Uh, I had the opportunity of meeting Mullah Omar three times. And we raised this issue of Osama bin Laden and Afghanistan being used as a springboard uh, against uh, countries adjoining uh, Afghanistan, in, that includes Pakistan, sometimes China, sometimes Chechnya. He said, I can't uh, you know, uh, uh, get these people out because they have fought alongside our uh, brothers in Afghanistan and they have lost their lives. Some are buried here, some have got married here. So we have affiliations and we can't ask them to go. So, I mean, this is their inner feeling. And secondly, when uh, Afghanistan had made certain promises in Qatar that uh, they will not allow their land to be used against any adjoining country anywhere, they are not fulfilling that promise. That is why U.S. has raised this point. And the statement saying that Pakistan has the right to defend itself of course, we uh, have the right to defend ourselves in the territory. But I think the hidden statement is that Pakistan may take action across the border 
where these are these, these camps exist or we feel that uh, these people are attacking from various places so pakistan has many options to do that but that will be a very sad thing it will uh, further complicate the situation and i hope somehow the other it can be avoided we should come with a very strong hand on the elements right. in pakistan general heather your point is well taken i'll come to this uh, particular point uh, when you when you mentioned the feeling among the ranks of the Afghan Taliban, they feel that the TTP militants had been fighting along with them against the international troops. Now, since the international troops withdrew uh, during the last year, so what happens to be the justification of waging such terrorist attacks against a country which facilitated the peace and reconciliation process over there? You see, the feeling in Afghanistan is that Pakistan lent its shoulder uh, in the war against terror by Parvez Musharraf by allowing America to use our land routes and our airspace to attack Afghanistan. And they feel that they were let down. And that's why they have very strong feelings sometimes against Pakistan, in spite of our sacrifices of housing millions of Afghan refugees and looking after them in every possible way to help them and to bring peace there, but uh, they forget the, uh, this particular thing. And their main trade even today is through Pakistan. And uh, Pakistan sometimes suffers because of smuggling and other reasons. But uh, this is their feeling and uh, that Pakistan helped them. And so in general public, this is the uh, thought prevailing. And as far as uh, uh, the TTP is concerned, they also want to have the same type of system and governance uh, like Emirate of Afghanistan in Sawat and adjoining area, especially erstwhile Quata. And they say so openly that we want to also establish the same sort of uh, system here. But of course, anybody who goes against the constitution of Pakistan or disturbs the peace, I think uh, very strong measures will be now taken. To tackle with them. Right. Uh, Mr. Khan, what happens to the justification for those terrorist groups? Uh, as General Muinuddin Heather has mentioned, that there is a feeling among the Afghan Taliban ranks that the TTP militants supported them in their fight against the international troops. Now, once they have withdrawn from, the, from there, uh, so what happens to be uh, the justification for the Afghan authorities not taking a concrete action against such elements, no matter if they have fought besides them? Well, as General Saab mentioned, uh, they have this feeling that we have a very old association. We have fought against a common enemy for o over 20 years, and, and therefore we are not going to let them down. But I must point out that the, the TTP uh, is, is not a single uh, group as such. It is a, a, a sort of association of different groups, and sometimes they don't agree with each other. Sometimes certain factions break away, like you know about the Umar Khorasani's group, which is now closer to Daesh and things like that. Similarly, the Afghan Taliban also do not have a central authority even today. Some of the border areas, some of the uh, the uh, people who are the, the Afghan Taliban who are controlling the border areas uh, are not necessarily being directed by the center in, so, uh, in Kabul. Was there so, not a single unit at that time when they struck a, a, a deal with the international um, forces over there? There like was the a form? group that was nominated uh, to negotiate on their behalf and, and that group was accepted by all these people. But today, as far as uh, the administration is concerned, as far as the share in the funding and uh, is concerned, uh, there are uh, separate groups that are loosely aligned with each other. Then the other thing that I want to point out about the Pakistani Taliban, how did the Pakistani Taliban come into being? I mean, it started pretty early, like 2002 or something, when uh, the Pakistani armed forces went into tribal areas for the first time in 55 years. Uh, they were ostensibly chasing uh, Afghan and Uzbek and Chechens who had run away from the American attack in Afghanistan. But finally, in 2006 or 7, Seven. when there was an attack in Bajor on a madrasa, 
That is when in 2007 they finally announced uh, their existence uh, formally. And, and, and so at, at that time, uh, the group that was formed was some were tribals who were disgruntled or were angry at the presence of Pakistani forces in their areas. But there were also criminal gangs because, you know, the economy in that area was being run on, on the drug trade, on kidnapping for ransom and uh, on uh, car jacking and things like that. So a lot of criminals who did not find space became uh, part of the TTP. And, and today also one of their demands is that FATA ought to go back to its original position because they like that kind of condition where they can thrive in the relatively uh, lawlessness uh, sort of situation. So and that is why it is completely unacceptable for the Pakistani authorities. Oh, absolutely. But, but I have to point out, uh, we cannot kill all the Taliban, right? And we should not appease them either. So we have to find a middle ground. We have to expose them for what they are by asking publicly what is it that they want. Let us say that they say that, you know, uh, we are being uh, unjustly treated by the Pakistani state. So let's talk about that. If they have certain demands that publicly we can expose and say whether it is fair that we accept those demands or we don't accept those demands. That is one way of exposing them. The other thing, of course, is that when you have the writ of the state, you cannot allow uh, people to act in an area where they will be challenging that writ. The difference today, I have to point out, is that earlier on, they had a lot of support locally. There, where there was resistance amongst the tribes, uh, almost 200 leaders were killed by these people. Today, there is a difference. In Swat especially, and to some extent in Waziristan, the locals do not support the TTP. Right. So that is an important consideration. The other thing I feel that one needs to point out, you know, a lot of people I hear saying that, you know, there are only three to 4,000 people. How is it that we cannot handle them? Well, you know, they're not four or 5,000 people standing on a battlefield uh, confronting our forces. They are a guerrilla group. They are an insurgent group. So they are scattered all over. They're not in uniform that I can identify them and attack them. So it's a very different kind of conflict that needs to be fought. Right. But the most important thing is we need to remove local support. Without local support, they cannot survive. And if the interest of the locals is converging with the interest of the state, then there will be people informing upon them and it will be easy for us to weed them out from there. Right. Your point is well taken. Uh, General Heather, when we talk about um, uh, finding a middle ground, when, um, as uh, Mr. Khan has pointed out, that we can't kill all uh, the militants of uh, Tariq Taliban Pakistan, and of course we are not going to appease the terrorists at the same time, so there should be a uh, middle ground. And at the same time, we have seen a hint by the Interior Minister of taking a direct action in Afghanistan. On the other side, we see the Foreign Office uh, still um, uh, wanting to engage through negotiations with the Afghan authorities. Now, how crucial this particular engagement at this particular point in time happens to be for Pakistan and what should uh, be the option at the hands of Pakistani authorities uh, in order to engage with the Afghan Taliban? I think the, this engagement has been going on for, um, for over a year. From Imran Khan's days, while he was in power, uh, there were delegations going there, there were discussions were taking place, and uh, many people said uh, it should be discussed in the parliament as to what are the conditions uh, uh, with which they are negotiating, uh, the state is negotiating with, with, with the TTP. Uh, but they were not taken into confidence. But what we heard uh, leakages from that was that some of their demands were against the constitution of Pakistan and uh, they were unacceptable to us. So over the years, I mean, they have broken the uh, ceasefire which was established for a few weeks. And secondly, they have hardened their attitude. And when they came to Pakistan, uh, 
uh, they started their old ways of uh, you know asking people for ransom asking people for money and uh, using arms and taking heights of sawat and other places and also sometimes attacking the, uh, the security forces so what i understand is that our foreign minister has given a very strong statement that it is not acceptable and our minister of state anara bani khar she went to afghanistan and she also issued a statement which shows that uh, our negotiations and our appeals to afghanistan or to ttp are not working and now i think they are taking a tougher stance this is what interior minister uh, stance says and others and this statement from america that pakistan has the right to defend uh, i mean every state has got the right to defend itself within its borders but if somebody in, in the, from the adjoining country from some base is attacking pakistan then of course we have the right to attack that base which will be a, of course not a very good thing to happen it will further complicate relation and secondly sometime you hear about this fence that pakistan had made with cross border amount of money and we sometimes see on the social media the fiddling or trying to uh, you know bring down that fence in some places and uh, so i think we have to strengthen our borders we have to improve our intelligence and as the ambassador said we have to cut support of the ttp from the public so that the support is cut off and it will be difficult it will be difficult for them to survive and easy for us to trace them and of course those who don't believe in peace and will not listen to any reason have to be dealt severely and that means they have they, they have to be attacked and i think uh, this was the two days conference of national security committee this resolve has been shown and let us see uh, what afghan government has to now say about about uh, about appeals because this can't go on like this and this peace that we had won with you know lot lot of loss of life uh we cannot throw it away uh, just like that so uh, general heather uh, there is a statement by uh, afghan authorities spokesperson zibullah mujahid that they are determined and committed to um uh, secure the uh, regional peace and security so after this particular statement don't you think there should be a realization among the afghan authorities ranks that this particular border fencing was a gigantic exercise of course from the pakistani side there should be a lot of efforts to secure that and uh, regulate the border management but we have seen incidents from across uh, the border of uprooting this particular uh, thing also at times so uh, it was actually meant to regulate illicit trade and also the infiltration of these uh, militant elements also so when they talk about um, uh, committing themselves for regional security and stability don't you think it happens to be their responsibility also to ensure that this border fence remains intact surely surely and this border fence is well within pakistan territory it is not bang on the pak afghan border it is well within pakistan territory pakistan can erect a wall can pakistan can erect a fence to ensure that there is no infiltration of terrorists and and to stop smuggling and crossing of the border which all the refugees had got used to when the soviets attacked they could cross from anywhere into kpk or into baluchistan from all sides and i as the interior minister slowly started restricting their movement ultimately asking them to only come through chaban or through torham and mulla umar told me that this is a very uh, strong step that i had announced and they are very poor and they can't travel from so many places to only these two points i said i mean we have a border with india and everybody has to go through waga everybody has to go to islamabad to get a visa so i mean my, if my countrymen tell me that why afghanistan can they can cross from anywhere so they are they have been used to this for several years so this fence is of course is not suiting them but since it is very essential we have to safeguard it and we have to make it very clear that anybody who wants to uh, fiddle with it then we will 
deal with it strictly. I think we should do that. And we have to impose restrictions on the crossing points also, ensuring that somebody coming should have a visa, should have some valid travel document to enter Pakistan. I see many people who are coming from Chaman and elsewhere who are without visa, without any documents. Right, your point is well taken. We're joined by another participant on the phone line by Dr. Adil Sultan. He is a dean, head of the Department of Strategic Studies at University. Dr. Sultan, thank you very much for taking time out for views on news tonight. We really appreciate that. Now, uh, when we talk about expression of a firm resolve to send an unequivocal message to the Afghan authorities by the National Security Committee of Pakistan that they should end the patronage to the uh, Tariqa Taliban militants uh, who have safe havens over there on the Afghan soil. So how do you think seriously the Afghan authorities should take this message? Uh, we have been here before also. This is not the first time that uh, such things are happening and this is not the first time that these statements have been made by the Pakistani side. So I think uh, it's the uh, same cycle going on uh, again and again where uh, once due to their uh, lack of capacity to deal with these crops because uh, Afghanistan internally is uh, quite weak and fragile, they can't control uh, their own strongholds, and uh, it's difficult for them also to deal with these uh, groups, these splinter groups. So I think uh, uh, we, ha we have seen and we have experienced that uh, Afghan Taliban they do not have the capacity at the moment. Uh, so whatever statements that Pakistani side uh, has made and has made in the past also, and we have seen the results. So uh, these would be statements uh, just like the past and I don't Dr. think Sultan, so. Dr. Sultan, beg your pardon for the interruption. When we uh, talk about this question of capacity of the Afghan Taliban, so we saw uh, them taking over Kabul and uh, making uh, they, what they understood that the international troops withdrew uh, because of a kind of insurgency and the kind of uh, aggression they had been waging against them. Uh, they are also giving statements which don't actually allude to the fact that they have the uh, issues of capacity when there were certain statements made by Interior Minister Rana Sanaula which were reacted to by the Afghan Taliban spokesperson and they said uh, that uh, we are ready to defend uh, the territorial integrity and independence and knew how to defend the country so when these sort of statements come so the question of capacity doesn't happen to be valid uh, in that instance. Uh, I'm talking about the capacity of the Awan Taliban. So we know that uh, there is lack of capacity. So that is what I was saying. But if you are alluding to the past uh, uh, when the Tal Awan Taliban took over and the commitments that made, but if you see their behavior now, it has significantly changed. They have drifted again towards that extremist form of government and the kind of policies that they are implementing domestically. So that exposes that they do not have the capacity and they are again banking on the same extremist ideology to assert their strong, uh, they assert the government in their own country. So I was talking in that sense that they do not have the capacity. So whatever statements we do make, we need to understand that it would be futile because asking the Awan Taliban government to uh, deal with these uh, splinter or the terrorist organizations, uh, they do not have the capacity and they do not have the will at the moment also. Right. Dr. Sultan, there, uh, there has been a continuous expression from the United States of America of help and support in dealing with this uh, TTP threat. So what sort of uh, expectation should be there uh, from the Pakistani authorities when it comes to the continuous expression from the U.S. side? Uh, this I see is uh, troubling from my perspective because when the United States offered this kind of support publicly and we also applaud that support, uh, this might add fuel uh, to the uh, one narrative that this is again a 2.0 U.S. war on terror uh, now being waged through, United, uh, through Pakistani forces. So that is something uh, that I would say is uh, we should be very cautious about uh, uh, propagating that the United States is supporting Pakistan and Pakistan uh, will uh, take care of these. I think this is our uh, war, this one specifically, because they have waged these terrorist uh, attacks against Pakistan and the kind of statements the National Security Committee also made. We should order it and we should take the remedial measures, but by linking, by 
bringing this United States support, uh, I fear that the one or the TTP, they would take this opportunity to project it as, again, United States invading in Afghanistan through U.S., uh, through Pakistani uh, forces. So that's the link that I am very cautious about, that we should be careful about it. So, but no matter if they continue to carry out terrorist attacks against the state of Pakistan, <laughs> and Pakistan shouldn't be seeking help from the international community, especially the major powers. Of course, there has been, uh, Pakistan has been facing economic difficulties also. So if, even if it is now our own war, we definitely need support from the international community, especially the U.S., um, which struck a deal with the Afghan Taliban and made them have a commitment that the Afghan soil won't be allowed to be used against uh, the neighboring countries in particular. Uh, as we have seen the history, the major powers, especially the United States, support for its own interests. So whatever support they are, uh, they are likely to provide in terms of uh, moral support, diplomatic support, or in terms of material support against Pakistan, uh, we should be very clear that they would be mainly catering for their own interests. What we have to differentiate that uh, we have to live in this region, so whatever kind of uh, strategy we adopt, to uh, contain or curtail these terrorist organizations. There has to be a stick and carrot kind of a policy which uh, partially worked in the past because we have seen even the United States or even the superpowers or the coalition led by the United States, they, cannot, uh, they could not uh, suppress the, these insurgencies. So I think we should be realistic enough. Uh, at the same time, we should be firm also that we cannot tolerate these kind of incidents from across the border, but uh, uh, we have to be kind of maintain balance in that approach. So uh, if we go by the statement by uh, Interior Minister Ronald Sanaula, if no action by the Afghan authorities against the TTP militants is taken on the Afghan soil, so Pakistan might be considering targeting those TTP elements in Afghanistan. So uh, if nothing happens and these uh, sort of incidents continue to happen from the Afghan soil, so uh, where, which side do you think the international community's support would be swaying towards? Like I said, uh, we would be justified in taking such actions, uh, rather preemptively or uh, retaliating against these uh, terrorist uh, attacks. We would be justified, so international law supports that. Uh, but we have to be mindful that continuous military operation and with uh, an expectation that we will be able to eliminate this threat altogether through uh, military means, I think we have uh, been there in, uh, before also. It has not worked. Uh, because uh, TTP is a brand name. Many terrorist organizations are using this brand name to carry out their own agenda. And we know that many of those terrorist organizations are being supported by the external elements also, the regional elements also. They're exploiting the situation. They see Pakistan at this moment vulnerable domestically, politically. So that, uh, that is why this upsurge in attacks also. So we have to differentiate that we have to engage them politically, but at the same time, do whatever is necessary, but do not overstretch. Even superpower was overstretched. It could not uh, achieve its objective militarily. So we have to be uh, very cautious about that. Your point is well taken, Dr. Adil Sultan, Dean and Head of Department Strategic Studies at University, joining us on the phone line. Thank you very much for your time. We really appreciate that. Uh, Mr. Khan, when uh, we talk about a U.S. expression of support and help to Pakistan in dealing with this particular threat, uh, so uh, we, uh, we had seen a provision of $15 million in the 2023 budget, um, and also there was uh, an approval of $450 million a deal for sustenance of the uh, air fleet over over here in Pakistan, uh, particularly the F-16. So what sort of practical manifestation uh, we could expect uh, when it comes to the help from the U.S. in particular? Well, I myself am also uh, a little skeptical about the statement that came from the U.S. State Department. Uh, as far as the lack of success in Afghanistan is concerned, the United States blamed two parties. One was Pakistan for so-called duplicity. And the other, of course, were its mortal enemy, the Afghan Taliban. And here they have a situation where both these parties uh, are going to be fighting each other. So uh, if the United States wants to help us, uh, they should firstly uh, use their influence with the IMF and with other 
people who uh, assist us to strengthen Pakistan's economy. Right now, political instability and a weak economy uh, will definitely handicap us in fighting terrorism. Now we have to let the international community know that it is in their interest, it's in the global interest for us to fight terror wherever we can. The other thing that they can help us with is that they know who are the people who finance the TTP and they have influence over these people. So they have to use their influence uh, to make sure that the funding of TTP is stopped. The third thing that I want to stress is as General Muin Heather said, we need to focus on the border. The whole uh, TTP problem, uh, the people that they recruit, all that happens on the border between KP and Afghanistan. So this is an area where we need to focus and then specifically on the border. Now we have this fence and we see time and again video clips of people coming and breaking the fence. Now I accept the fact that it's a very, very long border, but there are technologies where you, know, you can have virtual fencing, electronic fencing, together with increased border posts, which may be equipped with either helicopters or fast vehicles and night vision goggles. And then the Americans can help us with satellite technology as far as cross-border, you know, people crossing or some activity on the border, because they have in the past shown us satellite footage of individuals crossing uh, the border. So to, to see vehicles close to our fence, I'm sure they can in, uh, inform us and we can be quick and unforgiving when we go there and of course repair, etc., etc. But this is something where we need to focus because it will also stop one of the sources of funding of the TTP. One of the sources of funding of TTP as well as T uh, TTA today is drug smuggling. There's billion, multi-billion dollar trade and it mostly goes through here. Some of it goes through Iran, some of it goes through Central Asia. But Pakistan, if we can secure this border, we can also uh, manage to stifle uh, their sources of income. Oh, right, your point is well taken. General Heather, when we talk about U.S. support in this particular regard, a provision of $15 million in the 2023 budget to enhance security along the Pak afghan border. Uh, so how uh, more help we can expect from the U.S. as uh, Mr. Khan has uh, very uh, comprehensively mentioned uh, three important points and uh, the most important uh, of uh, all these is the border fencing and uh, the provision of technology in order to enhance that particular um, uh, vigilance on the border. Yes, uh, I think the most important help and assistance which can be given to us is intelligence. They have still their influence within Afghanistan those people whom they have nursed for last 20 years, their moles there, and uh, otherwise they have good intelligence through electronic surveillance and other means. So they are in a position to tell us where the TTP is and how, what is their system of movement into Pakistan, etc., etc. So, so intelligence sharing, I think, is very important. Second thing is this: uh, I think in the last core commander conference. They discussed this matter of fence. And already, I think we had taken many steps to uh, surveil it and to ensure that we can respond in a short span of time if somebody is trying to damage this or pull it down, then I think we have to come down with a heavy hand. And I think a few incidents, if you kill those people who are fiddling with the fence, I think this may stop. And this will be a, a strong message to the Afghans that they should withhold their people who are trying to bring down this fence. Otherwise, I think electronic surveillance, other things, Pakistan has now this drone technology. And if you fly a drone, which has very long endurance, uh, they also can detect all the movement uh, along the fence or elsewhere. And secondly, uh, this uh, upgradation of F-16s or some other electronic or night vision devices of which uh, our scouts and people on the border of Pak Afghan border need 
I think we can ask them to help us with that. More defensive in nature rather than offensive uh, weapons we shouldn't be asking uh, so that Afghans don't get alarmed. But a message should be given to them that we are going to safeguard our interest and our territory and enough is enough. And this hard-earned peace uh, that we had, you know, established after loss, loss of life, uh, now again, there will be a strong political wing, will, there will be a strong resolve, and there will be coordinated intelligence-based operations against groups in Pakistan, first of all, and ensuring that there no more crossing takes place of these elements. They have been, you have seen some very ugly incidents on Chaman border, where they have opened fire with heavy weapons. And in the garb of that, many hundreds of Afghans, they cross into Pakistan border. I'm quite sure they were without any documents. So, I mean, this is a strategy that they're using. We have to negotiate with them. We have to make a clear message. And if they don't understand, we have to safeguard our interests. Right. We can't take it. Thank you. Afghan authorities are so desperate for the international recognition. Of course, they uh, look primarily towards uh, their neighboring country, Pakistan. Um, so, uh, don't you think Pakistani authorities can uh, use this particular uh, thing as a bargaining chip in order to uh, make the Taliban fulfill their commitments? Yes. I mean, Pakistan last time also, we were the first to recognize them and uh, asked Saudi Arabia and Abu Dhabi also, these three countries only, I think, uh, recognize them and we can still help them. But we are waiting. But the steps that they are taking within Afghanistan, for example, that they're closing down women education, their universities, they're saying women cannot you know, work in the NGOs. I mean, such like steps will not endear them. Uh, to the Western world and to uh, other countries. And uh, this way, I think they are uh, not going to get recognized soon. They have to ensure peace. And I agree uh, with Ambassador Saab when he says that, uh, and with you, that uh, when they were, you know, fighting with the NATO forces and U.S. forces for the last so many years, and after, you know, the, that they took over the various parts of the country, especially Ahmed Shah Massoud's son in the south and elsewhere. I mean, they showed strong resolve and they showed their capacity and they showed their will that uh, to take over the whole of the country. And if there were any pockets of resistance, they made sure they were removed by force. So they have the capacity in my this thing. And then they have good, very good intelligence because their Taliban are all over. So if they want to help us, then they can control TTP. They can control. Right, your point is well and taken. They... Uh, Lieutenant General Retired Muinuddin Heather, thank you very much for your time. Former Federal Interior Minister, former Governor Sindh, we really appreciate that. And we were honored to have been joined in the studio by Mr. Nasir Ali Khan. Former Ambassador, Mr. Khan, thank you very much for your time also. So we'll be discussing another uh, very important thing, another very important development, a very significant presser by the Finance Minister, Mr. Ishaq Dar, in which he has said that Pakistan will not default as we are fulfilling all the international commitments. And uh, he has also said that the political capital of the coalition parties has eroded due to tough economic decisions. And he also said that we have to save Pakistan. Therefore, uh, we took over the government. And uh, because of the uh, failed economic policies of the previous government, uh, led by Pakistan Tariqe and Saaf, the economic condition of the country reached to this particular level. And talk about this significant pressure, we are joined by Mr. Ali Salman. He is um, Executive Director, Prime Institute, and a senior economist. Mr. Salman, thank you very much for joining in at Views on News. So, first of all, the kind of stats and the kind of um, uh, uh, things have been shared by the finance minister during today's presser. Uh, what significance do you associate with this particular presser? Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Fihami, for uh, taking me in on this important uh, development. I have uh, followed the news. Uh, um, I think this was a response to the white paper, which was issued by uh, PTI yesterday. 
and in his presser today mr azhar um, uh, highlighted and assured the nation that um, the you know pakistan economy although facing challenges but will will not default on its uh, uh, payment uh, on the commitment um, which has made it to international creditors and at the same time i think they have also highlighted the the steps which the government is uh, taking to stabilize the exchange rate and fighting the challenges especially in the post flood uh, scenario and um, you know this is uh, important to highlight that uh, government not only is uh, facing the problem of stabilization but also uh, managing uh, the you know the the growth rate uh, challenges so it's not an easy situation for for the uh, for the country for the economy what is important is uh, that pakistan needs to stay committed um, as finance minister also highlighted Uh, to the uh, program, to the IMF program, to the IMF and, program, uh, Mr. Salman, your point is well taken. Now, when we talk specifically about this IMF program, uh, the government authorities have uh, repeatedly uh, said that the government remains committed to complete this IMF program. But there has been a delay regarding the ninth review since Pakistan has faced a lot of economic difficulties, especially in the aftermath of the recent devastating floods. Don't you think there should be a realization on humanitarian grounds that this country is facing? economic difficulties and there has been loss of about 30 billion dollars so there must be some relaxation to the conditions which have been put by the IMF which already been uh, dubbed by uh, Mr Hassan Iqbal as very harsh as well so i agree that uh, you know pakistan has to pay uh, you know first priority has to be on the restoration and the reconstruction of the zones and the areas agriculture which has been badly affected by the by the floods and i do not think that imf is against that and i am also positive that uh, in the past also we have seen that uh, international creditors including imf and the world bank have not opposed pakistan's government social assistance programs but the challenge is uh, that for instance um, import compressions or uh, the the artificial administrative uh, measures which have an effect on the exchange rate is uh, something not related with directly with the with flood uh, management and this is something i think the government of pakistan should carefully uh, review its policies and that has become one of the major stumbling blocks uh, in the you know in in the revival in the on time revival of the program so while it is true that pakistan economy is facing challenges uh, fiscal challenges in particular um you know it is important that uh, on our macro economy we stay committed to the program however on the flood uh, management the pakistan should uh, go to the international community as it is going to geneva very soon and we hope that it will be able to generate resources and then direct those resources uh, to uh, the to, to to the management and to restoration Right, your point is well taken, Mr. Ali is Salman Alwi, Senior Economist and Executive Director at Prime Institute. We really appreciate your time for being on Views on News. And that's all from today's Views on News. Till the next one, take good care of yourselves.